Good morning to our viewers in the United States. Good afternoon to those in Europe and a warm welcome. My name is Jan Fleck. I'm the Senior Director of the Europe Center here at the Atlantic Council. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event on debriefing the US-EU Summit. Last Friday, the United States and the European Union held their first official summit since 2021 here in Washington, DC. President Joe Biden and part of his cabinet, cabinet played host to the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, and to the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and, and her team. Uh, the summit took on increased geopolitical significance following the terrorist attacks by Hamas against Israel and the unfolding conflict. At the same time, Russia's war in Ukraine continues with relentless intensity now for over 600 days. Tensions are mounting in the, in the Western Balkans, all of which are testing the transatlantic relationship and especially also the European Union. There's also, of course, persistent concern over China's challenge in the Indo-Pacific. Also on the docket were issues of bilateral concern, including longstanding stressors in the US-EU trade and economic relationships on issues like steel and aluminum tariffs, lingering frustrations from the Inflation Reduction Act and its implications, potential implications for Europe, and the prospect of a critical mineral club, uh, and much more. To unpack the summit, the good and the not so good uh, alike, and to discuss what's still ahead for the US e EU agenda before both sides of the Atlantic fully enter election and transition mode next year, I'm delighted to be joined by an excellent panel of Atlantic Council colleagues. With us today, we have Francis Burwell, Distinguished Fellow with the Atlantic Council's Europe Center and Senior Director at McLarty Associates and a longtime EU watcher, of course. We also have Charles Litchfield, our dear colleague at the Geoeconomic Center, Deputy Director of the Center, and C. Boyden Gray, Senior Fellow. And Dan Mullaney, a non-resident Senior Fellow with both of our centers, Europe and Geoeconomics, uh, so you'll you'll help us bridge uh, all of the issues here, Dan. Um, you are obviously uh, someone who has served a distinguished career in U.S. trade policy at the U.S. Trade Representative Office, having served as Assistant USTR for Europe, uh, most recently, uh, obviously with a focus on Washington's trade relationships with the European Union. For our viewers online, joining us online, Please join in on the conversation. We'll get to your questions towards the end by submitting uh, your questions at askac.org. Um, and make sure to follow along on X, formerly Twitter, at AC Europe. With that, let me turn to my colleagues for this discussion and kick off with Fran Burwell. In the lead up to the summit, you wrote a piece for New Atlanticist in which you essentially argued in this against this geopolitical backdrop, the US EU relationship and partnership and the summit has to focus on the geopolitical challenges, conflicts, crises out there, and not just on inward looking or bilateral issues. How did the how did the summit perform by that yardstick? Did US EU leaders listen to you? And what were your key takeaways from, from the summit? So I think that I would give maybe a grade of B minus. Um, I think this was a very geopolitical summit, unlike other summits in the past. Uh, traditionally, the US-EU summit has been about more nitty gritty trade and economic issues. Uh, and this time, in part because of the global situation, uh, it was inevitable that the focus was going to be more on geopolitical issues and on uh, how the U.S. and the EU together are trying to address those. It was very important, I think, that the U.S. and the EU came out with a unified stance, first on Ukraine. We were going to continue to support them, however long it takes. There were some interesting uh, new measures talking about uh, looking at third-party nationals, um, entities who may be subverting the sanctions regime. 
uh, and also looking at how Russian uh, money that is uh, being held outside by mostly European um, entities might be used to uh, assist Ukraine uh, in its reconstruction. So there were some interesting small bits there. Um, on Israel and Hamas, I thought the statement was more balanced than one might expect, given that Europe and the United States have not always had the same perspective on the Middle East. Um, it talked both about the terrorist nature of the attacks, uh, Israel's um, Israel's right to defend itself, but also about the need for Israel to adhere to international law, including international humanitarian law, um, and did speak about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. I think the big question for that is how long uh, this consensus will continue. We have had some foreign ministers discussions in Europe this week, and we will have uh, the European Council, the summit meeting on Thursday and Friday, uh, and they will undoubtedly have some more to say about that. Perhaps the biggest um, shift from previous summit statements was the amount of time and uh, language, three quarters of a page on the statement, uh, devoted to China. And here it was very clear that we are not decoupling, but de-risking is required. And I thought it was the clearest statement we've seen from the two of them together, not just talking about non-market economies, et cetera, so we all know who they're talking about, but talking about China directly. But um, what I would say where the challenges still remain is that this was very much a bilateral summit. There was a little bit of focus on other countries, uh, particularly uh, the need to get more sustainable financing for, um, for, uh, for countries in the global south. For, and I think that um, we need to see a lot more of that. It is time for the US and the EU as they're thinking about you know, the world of democracy versus authoritarianism, which is another strand that kind of ran through the summit document. It's time for them to reach out more actively to those countries that are sitting on the fence or ambivalent for some reason, and to, for the US and EU to figure out a joint strategy about how to do that. And that's where I think this, this particular summit was uh, not as far reaching as it could have been. There were obviously some other challenges, uh, particularly on the economic side. Um, and I know uh, my colleagues will comment on that. Thank you, Fran, for for teeing us up there, and we'll we'll come back to many of these the geopolitical uh, and and the third party and and China aspects that you already mentioned. Uh, let me turn to Charles Litchfield. Charles, um, there were really high expectations and a little bit of pressure building for both partners to um, produce some some breakthroughs on on a number of economic and trade issues, especially. Uh, obviously, the general arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminum, the the risk or the prospect of uh, Trump era tariffs snapping back. That deadline was pushed to January first um, to give the negotiations a little bit more room. Um, there was also high expectations for a critical minerals club in some form, shape, or form to be uh, announced or at least see major progress here. Um, are we well, on the economic front uh, a, a bit pointedly? Uh, was this this summit a, a bust? And and why, from a European perspective, do you do you suspect we didn't see any progress, real meaningful uh, breakthroughs here? And what is needed uh, moving forward? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Jon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I think from a European perspective, the reason why we haven't reached agreement on these important issues so far is that the US demands are too many and too too high. Um, and the global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminium uh, basically includes two components. The first requires the US and the EU to agree on how to evaluate Chinese overcapacity and what to do about it. And then we will move on to uh, standards around uh, producing steel and aluminium in a sustainable way. 
Um, they don't always put it out that explicitly, but that's basically the sequence of the negotiations. Uh, and on phase one, i.e. Chinese overcapacity, uh, the US has been much more demanding on what it wants to see happen and how it wants to see the EU complying with certain US evaluations of what Chinese capacity, overcapacity is and how that is penetrating the EU market. So understandably, for the EU, it's rather difficult to sign up to some of those um, US assessments, uh, to speak frankly, some quite difficult for some member states. Um, so I think that's where we're still hitting at um, a disagreement. Um, the second part of the GSA, um, which is to do with, uh, in, in quite an innovative way, um, making it easy for US steel and aluminium to enter European markets and vice versa. It's innovative because it will include this sustainable component. And understandably, it's unlikely that this will get done until we have tested the European uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, so that has come in insofar as it now, uh, there are mechanisms now to start evaluating what is coming into the European market. So the, the sort of... Um, the, the statistical operation is in place as of uh, October, uh, but the actual adjustment mechanism, the tariffs won't come in until 2026. So that second part of the GSA, it, you could perhaps blame the EU for that being a little bit more complicated, but the blame from an EU perspective for part one, just on Chinese overcapacity would be would be with the US. Um, and then the an EU policymaker would also perhaps blame the US um, for the failure so far of the critical minerals agreement, because that has been tied in with progress on the GSA, and that again is is a U.S. demand. So I'm speaking very frankly, and I, I don't uh, I don't think the EU would would ever speak this way, or even necessarily think this bluntly that uh, certain things are um, are the U.S.'s fault. Uh, but I think just for our viewers' understanding, it's it's uh, perhaps useful to to go through it in this in this somewhat simplistic way. Um, at least uh, some of that is. Um, well, everything I've said, everything I've said is true, and hopefully it helps people understand um, just in a schematic way. Um, however, is this a bust? Uh, I'm, I'm, I dare to hope not. Uh, they have given themselves a little bit more time to negotiate about these things. Uh, two months for the GSA and a few weeks for the CMA. I, I don't know if these um, timestamps mean anything. That's how it was formulated in the joint statement. Uh, the two months for the for the GSA is important, as you say, Yuan, because at the end of that, the uh, 232 tariffs will snap back. Uh, they're not entirely gone for the moment. They've been replaced by quotas. Uh, and if we don't reach an agreement um, by uh, uh, the end of the two month period, then uh, the uh, punitive tariffs will come back. Um, so again, speaking from the perspective of an EU policymaker, uh, that will concentrate the mind and hopefully uh, we will reach some sort of an agreement um, on the GSA, at least on this sort of phase one and Chinese, uh, how to evaluate Chinese overcapacity and what to do about it before in the long term um coming to an arrangement on uh, what sustainable steel is and how to how to um uh, give better terms to steel and aluminium that has been produced sustainably um that will well, that was always going to take longer uh, but i am hopeful that within the next two months we can at least agree on the first part on the critical minerals agreement it is disappointing uh, because as everyone uh, who follows this closely will know, um, the U U EU access to some US subsidies within the IRA depends on there being a CMA. Uh, it actually explicitly says in the joint statement that we're doing this in order to give access to European car producers to uh, Section 30B of the IRA. Um, that's probably a small little victory that they managed to put that in the joint statement, that we are negotiating together in order to give our producers, our EU producers, access to US subsidies. And that the US signed off on that is probably seen as, as a mini success. Again, a little bit of optimism within all the doom and gloom. Um, so we have we will know within the next few weeks. Uh, again, putting my EU policymaker hat on for the last time in, my, in this initial uh, speech. Um, there is a little bit of frustration that Japan was not held to such high standards when they got their mini deal on uh, critical minerals. Um, so we can go into some of the detail about why that was uh, later on. Um, but the feeling is that the EU is being held to a higher standard than, than others by the US. Obviously, this is unusual for an EU policymaker because they're usually uh, in control of trade negotiations. They usually call the shots. They usually have the highest standards. So this is an unusual position to be in. Uh, but hopefully they'll come to an arrangement in, in the next few weeks. Final point, um, uh, 
there is a little bit of concern, of course, that under the most pro-EU administration uh, ever, perhaps, um, this is the state of affairs. Not terrible, but not great either. So I think the the long term conclusion an EU policymaker would be drawing from this is this this is as good as it's going to get with the US, um, which is somewhat concerning, uh, given that this is often presented by the likes of uh, us, Yuan, uh, Fran, uh, and me uh, as the most pro pro EU administration ever. Um, if this is as good as it's going to get, uh, it's a bit concerning. Thank you, Charles. Lots, lots of stuff on the table, and and I can't wait for for Dan Mullaney to react. Is this as good as it gets for the EU with the United States? Uh, given your experience in government, maybe you can share a uh, uh, U.S. government. You can share the U.S. perspective, the sticking points, and and uh, what what you whether you agree with Charles. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the briefing. Of course, I'm not speaking for the U.S. government because I did retire from the U.S. government earlier Absolutely. this year. I, I, I have to say that um, I, I, I understand the um, the hope uh, that we would have arrived at an agreement on uh, steel and aluminum and on critical minerals by this summit. I have to say it was not very surprising to me at, at all that we didn't quite get there. Uh, and the reason I say that is that you know, the, the global arrangement on steel and aluminum is really nothing less than kind of re-imaging what kind of trade we're going to incentivize in agreements between the United States and Europe and the United States and like-minded partners. Um, you do have a, a, a classic model of free trade where you eliminate uh, all barriers and comparative advantage kicks in. And I think what we've... Uh, found is that, is that there's a, a bit of a new reality with uh, uh, large state enterprises, uh, non-market economy policies and practices, huge subsidies, where um, uh, some of the things that happen under that regime are not necessarily to everyone's ad 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 advantage. And so that you need um, to try to incentivize uh, not just low cost trade as, as if uh, everything was uh, was free market, but actually take some creative measures to incentivize sustainable trade, given the the, the imperative of, of addressing the climate change problem. It's not really something incentivizing sustainable trade, disincentivizing unsustainable trade from an environmental point of view is not really something that fits 100% in the, the, the current global framework. And so the parties are doing something really very new, very innovative, very imaginative in trying to find a way to incentivize sustainable trade in steel and aluminum, disincentivize non-sustainable trade. At the same time, uh, you know, there's another force in, in, in the global trading system, which we think was also not um, envisioned when the GATT and WTO rules were, were were, were put in place, and that's the operation of state enterprises, non-market economy policies and practices. So this is another instance where in this same agreement, we're also trying to incentivize trade in steel and aluminum from market sources and disincentivize trade from non-market sources. And I think it the, the fact that we have 232 tariffs in place at all is a reflection perhaps of the inadequacy of some of the current rules to address the, the current challenges. You know, the reason we have 232 national security tariffs is that there really wasn't another tool to address a situation that was not envisioned you know, 60 years ago or 80 years ago. Um, so I think it's really important to appreciate that when the United States and the European Union are sitting down on this global arrangement on steel and aluminum, they're really trying to do something quite creative, quite new, quite unprecedented, which is to find some method of incentivizing sustainable trade, disincentivizing unsustainable trade, incentivizing trade from market-based sources, disincentivizing trade from non-market-based sources. And so it was a uh, it was a huge task that uh, everybody had at hand. I, at, at, at the time, I, I thought the two years was uh, very ambitious for something which had really was revolutionary and something that had never been done before. Uh, I think 
both sides made a lot of a lot of progress. And I know that there was some reporting in the press about how close uh, we were to a deal. And then it finally it didn't happen ultimately for, for, for various reasons. I I don't think or, or I would not um, at this point cast blame on one party or the other. Um, I think they are both up against a, a hugely challenging situation. We need to find a way forward. We need to find a way forward that fits in with the U.S. legal structure. You know, what measures can we legally put in place domestically? Has to fit in with a very different set of institutions and a very different set of legal structure in the European Union. What measures can they put in place to, to accomplish these two things? So, you know, given the, 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 the differences in the two systems, institutions, the differences in the tools available, on either side to address these issues. Um, I think it's uh, maybe almost remarkable that they came as, as close as they did. Again, I certainly would have preferred that they reach a deal. It actually would have surprised me if in that short a period of time we'd have been able to do something quite so revolutionary. So I, I'm glad that we have um, apparently some breathing space to continue to work on this. I think that's really what's necessary. Um, it would be, to my mind, unfortunate if on January 1st, the European Union uh, triggered retaliatory tariffs because we weren't able to achieve uh, this this very uh, innovative agreement within two years. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, both parties will give some more time and space to try to get something done. If it can be done by the end of the year, that's great. But I think, you know, it, it's useful for both sides to give that um, give that process a little bit of space. Um, and, you know, another reason, if you will, to give it that space is that um, what we discuss and what we what we talk about in terms of the steel and aluminum, sustainable trade, non uh, market economy trade, you know, could also be a, a, a model or a blueprint for other new rules, other tools that we could use in other sectors to, to do the same. Because of course, steel and aluminum was like the leading edge of the, of, of the wedge in terms of uh, the challenges brought on by uh, excess capacity in China. But of course, it's not the only industry that falls in, could potentially fall in that category. So I think you know, we're arguably doing something that is, uh, addresses a, a, a current crisis or, or a current challenge, which is these 232 tariffs, um, but also one that has is going to have some broader applicability. So I think it's worth spending the time uh, to do it and to and to get it and to get it right. Um, I think I think much the same thing. Um, you'll forgive me, I'm in a hotel room in Brussels on my iPhone. So I, I, if, I'm, if I'm reaching in front of the camera, you're that's, doing that's, great, Dad. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hoping the iPhone doesn't like fall off the hotel ice bucket because then you'll you'll see the maybe another see the, transatlantic trade crisis. Another uh, another crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The fall of fall of the iPhone. Um, I think you know much the same thing can probably be said about the critical minerals uh, agreement. You know there too. Um, you know we had an the IRA. It 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 passed it passed Congress. It was. A, a monumental step forward to meeting the Paris Agreement uh, uh, commitments, which let's not forget, it wasn't that long ago that we very publicly pulled out of the Paris Agreement entirely. So that was a big step forward. Um, clearly, there are some issues. There was a, a, a an ability to consult ahead with European partners, other partners. Um, but I think in that instance as well, the, the parties are being very cr creative in finding ways to have an agreement with the European Union that can um, address the needs of, of the IRA. And also, it, you, you, you are supposed to, under the IRA, you're supposed to have a, um, you know, a free trade agreement. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not unthinkable that it has to have a certain amount of robustness to it uh, in order to, to, to satisfy those requirements. So there's there too, it's, to my mind, something totally unprecedented, something that requires a lot of creativity, requires a lot of a bit a bit more time. And I'm glad they're giving it uh, I'm glad they're giving that it that space. I do have some reflections on the overall um, summit, but uh, 
maybe I'll stop there since uh, I went into such exhaustive detail on no, steel. No, 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 no. This is great. I, 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 I want to um, bring in Charles to react uh, uh, for a moment and Fran, if she would like to. Um, and I know I'm seeing questions here in, in the chat at askac.org uh, popping up and we'll get to those in a minute. Please send more. Uh, but Charles, to, to Dan's point um, about this being uh, obviously a, a more challenging process as both partners are trying to do something, you called it very new, creative and innovative uh, in the context of a changed global economy compared to the the global frameworks uh, um, and the challenges we're seeing. Charles, do you think these challenges are uh, these these uh, the thinking on these very new, creative, innovative ways, quote unquote, um, are aligned enough between the United States and the EU? I mean, the EU reaction reportedly to the U.S. proposals were out of a concern, uh, the negative reaction were out of a concern for how this would sink and comply with WTO rules. And, and are, do we have the right approach and thinking even aligned to get there uh, is I'm, what I'm essentially asking. Yeah, so um, I, I was trying to be a little bit brazen in my presentation of what led to the lack of a deal in my initial talk. Um, and I'm sure Dan understands uh, my intention there. Um, I think, and I think Dan and Fran would also agree that the on on the sense of the destination, uh, there is quite a lot of agreement, uh, but it's how we get there. Um, so specifically on the next few months, um, yes, it was always ambitious to agree a GSA within two years. Uh, now we have two months. Um, perhaps that's even more ambitious, although there has been time to get a little bit closer, and um, I'm I'm still hopeful. Um, but given that we're recognizing the challenge is so great, uh, and that um, now that we have acknowledged that the the adversary here, or at least the problem we have to deal with is Chinese overcapacity and Chinese trade practices, um, you would hope that uh, that would create sufficient creativity, sufficient energy uh, for us to reach a deal. Um, so this is just a a frustration that I have is and so Dan is a, a US citizen sitting in Brussels. I'm an EU citizen sitting in, in Washington today. Um it's a little bit of frustration that uh we have we spend a lot of time uh saying just how much we agree on the diagnosis of the problems we have and the world uh, as it is today. Um I don't want to minimize the technical problems and barriers and disagreements. Um, but given that we spend a lot of time saying that we have a similar diagnosis of the problems, um, I would like us to, uh, to, to see us find some solutions. Um, the technical barriers are very high, though. Um, the EU will soon have an operative uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, the US does not have an internal carbon market. Some states do. Uh, so I don't want to minimize those problems. Um, I do hope given that we've gotten close, apparently, in negotiations, and um, I'm sure they have started talking about what sacrifices need to be made on both sides. Um, I, I am hopeful we managed to find the necessary creativity. Um, I'll leave it there. Dan, you, you want to react to that and also maybe weave in your overall impressions of, of, of the summit, and then we'll move to Fran. Uh, but good to keep that overall picture in mind, Charles. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think the, the, I mean, the task at hand was to, um, to uh, facilitate su sustainable trade in, in in some manner, um, and I think the, the statement references the progress that was made in identifying various tools for addressing emissions intensity, um, signaling that you know there are lots of different ways that one might be able to uh, address carbon intensity in a trade context. It is true that the EU has a, a, a regulation that they've already passed that I imagine they would very much like to be that mechanism. Um, on the other hand, to my mind, it's not necessarily a, a, a given that you know an existing tool is the only way uh, to do that. And there may well be be other tools that one could employ to uh, encourage uh, the sustainable trade. Um, 
I mean, I will say about CBAM, for, for, for instance, uh, I think Charles referenced to the fact that we, we, we don't have the same carbon trading system that the EU does. Um, and at least to my understanding, it's a fact that the, or it appears to be a fact that the EU rule requires partners to have the same system in place domestically as the EU does, which is, you know, arguably a bit of uh, extraterritorial uh, 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 overreach, potentially, um, and an ideal situation, perhaps, would be that, um, yes, there are measures in place to prevent carbon leakage, like a carbon border adjustment mechanism, but that that mechanism would also recognize other ways other than the same carbon trading emission system that Europe has, other ways of achieving a sustainability objective. So, you know, to, to, to my mind, a, an ideal tool for encouraging sustainable trade between the United States and Europe is one where we recognize each other's systems in a way that allows us to trade sustainable products and in a way that does not require one party to adopt pretty much the same law that another party has. And that is also a, a bit, to my mind, in the spirit of the World Trade Organization rules and specifically the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, the TBT Agreement, which uh, suggests that you should be looking at uh, equivalence of, of, of outcome and not necessarily equivalence of, of means. So, you know, if, if my reading of, of CBAM and how CBAM would operate is, is correct, it, it, it potentially falls short if sustainable U.S. steel ends up getting hit with the same charge as other partners just because the United States does not have the same system as, as the EU. So I, I, I raise that not only because of specific, as a specific comment on the carbon border adjustment mechanism and other mechanisms, um, but also as an illustration of, of how complicated th this is and how if you're wondering why uh, the parties you know, we're not able to reach an agreement, even though we share the objective. Um, I think that gives a flavor of the complexity, because could you go to the EU and say, great, put in place a carbon border adjustment mechanism, but recognize the outcome of sustainable trade in the United States, as opposed to the exact same system as the United States? You know, I, I don't imagine that the Europeans would, would jump at that opportunity. So I imagine there'd be a lot of discussion and maybe discussion of other tools that one might use. Um, anyway, it does, it, does make it, it does make it complicated. It does. It, but, so, uh, 10 seconds, uh, diff difficult for the EU to simply recognize that US um, exports are uh, sustainably made wholesale. Uh, but I do think this is sort of where the, the uh, compromise needs to happen that, um, uh, the transatlantic trading relationship is important that you recognizes it uh, and uh, meeting halfway might mean that there are deals done for specific sectors. Um, I, it's difficult for me to imagine the EU just uh, trying to use its influence, the so-called Brussels effect to impose CBAM on basically all its other trading partners. And it's been reasonably successful at that. But for the US making a special case, I think a special case does have to be made, but it won't be blanket. I think Sector by sector, you could imagine an, an, an evaluation happening where the average um, U.S. Uh, export is uh, deemed to be sustainably made and therefore an exemption could happen. Uh, I don't think it will be wholesale, though. Yeah, and I think that does illustrate the institutional rigidity, perhaps, on the EU side that prevents the parties from coming together on that point, meaning that you need to go somewhere else. So, you know... I think it's 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 complicated, and it's also complicated by some of the institutional and legal, you know, rigidities on 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 both sides and the the, the different legal systems. Um, With without diving into the specifics of that, we do have some questions in the chat about the legality of of various measures. Uh, I, we won't go there today. Um, we want to make it out of this panel discussion alive. Uh, so. Um, uh, but let me, let me ask you maybe briefly, you know, I, I want to bring in Thibault from, from Amcham EU. Uh, he, he has a question, you know, looking ahead, even with this complexity, Dan, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you respond first. 
Um, can we expect significant progress between now and the December ministerial, likely as part of the Trade and Technology Council? Uh, and how can we solidify this process before major elections? And we'll come to that in a broader sense uh, as well, major elections on both sides. Yeah, I, I think we just we need continued work and continued openness and creativity uh, on on both sides to reach uh, to, to to reach a deal. Whether that happens as part of the TTC, I mean, it is notable in this in the statement that you know, of course, the TTC was set up two, two years ago, the last summit we had, and this TTC reinforced the importance of the TCC in addressing these economic issues. I couldn't say whether it would this would be accomplished. I mean, the the steel the steel and aluminum uh, arrangement is not really technically part of the TTC because it comes out of a dispute. Um, so my guess is that would proceed on a parallel track. And as I said, I'm, I'm hoping that the parties give enough room for that to deliver results, which I think does require some more some more time. But if I could, I, 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 did, I didn't want to let the, the hour pass without mentioning that uh, a, a few other things that, are, that I think are notable um, in the in the summit was the support for the multilateral institutions and multilateral rules, and in particular um, the the mention of this discussion of, of dispute settlement reform and a and a target date, which is you know very uh, you know has been very unusual in this in this context for um, addressing uh, dis, the uh, dispute settlement reform. Um, I think this statement really did focus quite a lot on the support for multilateral rules and for reform. And for getting some of that uh, done, um, I think also, and I think for Fran alluded to this in the opening. You know, obviously, a, a big, I think, very nuanced, very balanced description of the common challenges in China, where they made clear. You know, if you look at the summit statement from two years ago, June, and I attended that summit. I, I didn't attend that. I was in proximity of this summit. I guess. No, I guess I wasn't because I was in Brussels. Um, but in the last summit. Very little mention of China. It, it, it specifically, you know, the general issue was was in there, but uh, uh, you know, not very much. In this statement, obviously, a whole paragraph on China. It was the economic issues. It was security issues. It was Taiwan Strait. It was making clear that this is not decoupling. This is engagement. This is constructive engagement. The importance of China as a partner, but also the need to be firm about the need to protect our economic resilience. And and to promote uh, fair trade practices. So I, I think it, it really, for me, this um, this represented, you know, uh, kind of a next stage and an evolution of a a convergence on between the United States and the European Union on China more broadly speaking, which I think is is significant and important because I think we need to, um, for the benefit of the relationship, we need to be uh, uh, agreeing on. Finding grounds to agree on on uh, on some of those issues, the challenges presented by China. This statement reflects that, and I think reflects a lot of slicing and dicing that had to happen between the last summit and um, and 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 this one. Um, there was also in the statement uh, a focus on on sort of some of the new tools that we need to work out together. You know, autonomous tools that is unilateral tools. But that we work out in collaboration uh, to address some of the new challenges. Um, I, we we talked about the reference to new tools for addressing emissions intensity. Uh, there was a very brief mention in the steel uh, and aluminum arrangement section. Uh, but there's also discussion of um, uh, outward investment screening and where the United States stood on that, where the EU stood on that, and the implication was that along with all the other autonomous measures that we have both been taking and and uh, promulgating on either side. Um, this is a, a, another in the list of those in which we have a common objective. We are pursuing unilateral tools, but talking to each other about making sure that the tools are effective, that we're working on them together. Um, and critically, that we avoid collateral damage, which has been uh, our, our Often been our challenge in in the past, um, so I think those those other aspects of the of the summit are also worth uh, are also worth noting in addition to you know, where we were on steel and aluminum. Thanks for 
getting us a little bit broadening out the 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 perspective here, Dan. I want to come to Fran and and pick up on that. Um, you already mentioned in your initial uh, uh sum up of of the council the the clearest language in some time or uh on on China. Um, you you discussed previously the the third country element and dimension of this. So what what items here do you think are the biggest sort of follow-up items that translate uh, can translate this summit into some actual follow-up actions from from the US and the EU, especially with a with a perspective of having about, I don't know, half a year on the European side before it's fully elections and transitions on the US side, maybe even a little bit sooner. So I'm glad you mentioned the elections because I on both sides because I did want to bring that into the discussion on uh, the steel arrangement. It's quite clear that this administration does not want to do anything that could be taken by their adversaries as disadvantaging U.S. steel workers. So if I were European, I would be thinking whether it is possible to make a steel arrangement before the election. Um, and I, I hate to be the skeptic on this. I think that neither party really has an interest in triggering the tariffs. So we can continue to kick this can down the road for quite some time. Um, and there are also some other, other things going on, but I, I'm skeptical that we will see agreements on either of these early in 2024, certainly by the TTC. Hopefully I'll be proven wrong, but this is also points to uh, the fact that the US and the EU are major trading partners. We have a complicated relationship. We are both uh, very, very large. So it's like uh, two elephants in the negotiating room rather than a large country and a small country, which is often the case. But I think we need to also look at these, as you said, Jorn, in the larger geopolitical context. And if I was going to take this summit and say, okay, here's the to-do list for uh, the rest, I would be thinking about how do we keep ourselves unified as the Israeli anticipated incursion into Gaza proceeds? How do we keep ourselves unified on that? Um, and how do we provide humanitarian assistance or allow the provision of humanitarian assistance? How do we work with other countries in the region to keep this conflict from spreading? There is increased violence um, on the West Bank. And I think that we are at a, an extremely dangerous point in terms of the, the geopolitics and the peace and stability of the region. And the US and Europe both have uh, some diplomatic weight in that area and sometimes with different partners. What can we be doing together to um, make- You muted yourself, Fran. What can we be doing together to make sure that we the region does not truly spin out of control? I would also point to continued cooperation on Ukraine. Uh, the EU now has this um, arrangement for continuing to buy ammunition. We need to make sure that things like that are done to enhance the entire effort towards Ukraine. Um, in Europe, there is some suspicion that as our politics head toward the election, uh, there will not be as firm a U.S. commitment to Ukraine. We need to work together to make sure that both commitments to helping Ukraine financially, militarily, um, and in terms of uh, making sure that sanctions are properly enforced, that those commitments remain strong. I think on China, uh, we have seen some occasional Chinese military incursions, I don't, that's a strong word, but incidents. Uh, and I think we need to be on the same page with China. And I think that Europe itself needs to be on the same page. We had the von der Leyen and Macron visits simultaneously a few months ago, which both sent very different messages to China. So I think we need to figure out how we are on the same uh, page together with that. 
And then I think, as I mentioned, we need to really think strategically about how to reach out to others. The TTC did some interesting work with joint projects on providing laptops and bandwidth in Jamaica and Kenya. That's a teeny, teeny, tiny little bit of what needs to be done in order to ensure that these, that these countries see the virtues of democracy and rule of law and are willing to stand up to help us uh, support that. Um, so I think there's actually quite a good and positive to-do list. And we have to, uh, despite the challenges, I mean, it's a positive to-do list, but that sort of reflects how big the challenges are. Um, I think we need to make sure that we don't focus on trade issues to, I can do that as, you know, I love to talk about trade disputes, et cetera, but I think that we need to make sure that that doesn't become how people identify this relationship. The relationship is about, is now big difference from the previous summit is the relationship now is about a huge, a much larger more political global agenda and not about did we get a steel agreement or not. Thank you, Fran. And maybe turning to Charles and to, to that point, Fran, how do we, um, you know, isolate those more contentious issues in the relationship while we also understand that at, at a strategic level, um, we need to maintain that unprecedented cooperation, whether it comes to Ukraine, the Middle East, Uh, or or China more broadly, not just in a, uh, a trade policy sense. Charles, uh, do you see any any hope for progress there before the election cycles fully kick in on both sides um, in terms of that to-do list and delivering on that to-do list? Well, before I say whether I'm optimistic or not, uh, some some remarks on the formats and how we have set up the dialogue between the US and the EU. Uh, Dan alluded to it as well, the separate tracks. Uh, the TTC, uh, learning from past mistakes and just past experience, has been created mainly for these sort of positive conversations on uh, new regulations or avoiding a divergence in uh, regulations on new areas of the economy. And um, despite the fact that it attracts some mockery because the TTC is one of the main engagements we have between uh, the main decision makers on both sides, and yet we have to have separate tracks to talk about all the disagreements. Um, despite that mockery, I think it's overall been quite a good idea. Um, I engage in some of the mockery myself, but I do think isolating the TTC and the positive conversations from the more difficult conversations has allowed for the TTC to have some arrangements to its name. Again, people say they're too thin, but they exist uh, and they they deserve um, some recognition. As Fran mentioned, the initiatives trying to uh, woo uh, fence sitters on the sort of uh, global order question, um, that's been somewhat successful, if small. Uh, there have been bigger macro achievements like the Declaration on the Future of the Internet, um, the um, standardization uh, mechanism which allows private stakeholders um, to notify that they see divergence happening in new areas of the economy, and uh, they can try to get uh, regulators on both sides of the Atlantic to nip it in the bud so, so that the uh, pro-rule of law Western uh, economic space maintains some sort of first mover's advantage on um, regulation. These things sound very micro, uh, but they can have macro implications. And I do think the TTC um, is probably the right format, given the difficulties, um, for some of the positive conversations to take place. Let's see what will happen in December. I think it's in the US again this time. Uh, but I think Dan's right. The the uh, imminent uh, and important conversation trying to get the global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminium uh, over the line, at least for phase one, that will be separate. Um, so some positive remarks that I've just made on the TTC have to be um, contrasted by uh, this durability question. Uh, the TTC is not does not bind the US government or the EU in any way. Um, a future administration could simply decide not to engage in the TTC. And that is that is a problem, um, given that uh, the most likely alternative to a Biden administration, a Trump administration, will go out of its way to undo everything the Biden administration has done. Uh, and I think this is a source of concern in the US and the EU. 
Um, on the EU side, there is an election, uh, but irrespective of the outcome, and it is very important what happens in European Parliament elections, um, but just because there is a slightly different composition of the Parliament does not mean that the EU can no longer engage, engage in the TTC. Uh, this does not mean that the European Parliament is a rubber stamp institution. I think for TTIP, and Dan uh, bears the scars of that, um, there was a direct implication from the composition of the European Parliament to TTIP because that was a free trade agreement which uh, did involve more, uh, did involve the Parliament more. In this case, really the durability question is, is um, the concerns about that come from the US and not, not the EU. Um, so those would be my answers. I think that uh, we are coming up with these tools and separate tracks to try and isolate positive conversations, but it does mean that these institutions and dialogues are less durable and uh, exposed to um, political risk. Any reactions to that, Dan? I, I do want to come to a, a future-proofing, fireproofing question here, lightning round at the end, but maybe give you uh, two minutes to respond, uh, Dan, as well. Sure, and and maybe I can tip my response to the future proofing um, thing. I, I I think it would be it would be useful to have something more uh, a, a dedicated tr trade bundle that addresses some of the positive things that Charles you correctly uh, cited, uh, avoiding divergences in the future. Um, you know some of the the, the questions of of, of standards. Um, I think we we do have we do have a lot of a lot of common objectives in the trade space, many of them related to non-market economy policies and practices, um, but there are others. And I think in the trade context, if we focus on those things where our economies have common objectives, I think the work between the United States and the EU can endure if we're still pursuing those common objectives, regardless of, regardless of an election. I mean, certainly an, an attitude towards the importance of relations with allies that can that can change from uh, from administration to administration. But the core interests in terms of uh, things like um, uh, non-market economy policies and practices in terms of a level playing field, um, in terms of all those issues, I, I think if we if we focus on those core common interests, I think that does go along and build on those. That does go a long way towards future proving future pr proofing the, uh, the 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 relationship. I think it would be good if there were actually a, a package, an agreement that reflected this that would have some durability. Um, but if you don't have that, I think you know you you can identify the things that we that are sort of core, common interests that will exist regardless of elections on on either side of the Atlantic. Thank you, Dan. Fran, to you on on the question of with a less with the potential prospect of a less Europe friendly U.S. administration, maybe um, what what are the one or two things you would recommend in terms of future proofing, fireproofing this this relationship? So first off, I think one of the things that the Biden administration and, and the Commission has not done very well there are little starts right now is bringing in business stakeholders and uh, into the TTC process. And that it's just a struggle. It's hard to get business to talk about things that are positive and that are uh, also future facing as opposed to immediate concerns. Um, and so I think that if we were faced with a particular administration that really did not want to continue relations with the EU, and I would note that if it's another Trump administration, uh, former President Trump was decidedly anti-EU, not just anti-Europe, but specifically the EU. Um, I think that it would be a very real challenge and the only hope for something like the TTC is if business were to stand up and say, this is worthwhile, this is something that we have to do because this is a major market Europe is a major source of revenues for American corporations. Um, so I think that I'm not very optimistic um, if the future goes in that direction. Uh, I do agree that I think any future president of the commission would have an interest in continuing the TTC. 
That said, I also think that it's time for the TTC to step up a little bit. Um, I think that it was very, very good to um, isolate the TTC in the beginning from some of the hard questions, but it has proven itself over two years. And it has also built relations much more deeply within both the US and the European Commission bureaucracies, which is a very interesting uh, experiment, um, bureaucratic experiment. Um, we face issues that are, I think, on the trade front, much more serious than steel. And I would point to the discussion about CBAM. I would also point to uh, a set of rules uh, coming out of the EU now uh, about corporate sustainability, uh, due diligence and reporting. We've had deforestation uh, rules, and we both are also trying to figure out how to reconcile our forced labor measures. Um, and I think these are going to affect American and European companies across their entire supply chains. And we need to be talking now about how to create awareness and, and deconflict those. And the TTC would be a very good place to do that. Charles, 30 seconds. Uh, what's the one thing, and, and hopefully on a positive note, you think we can achieve between the United States and the European Union before the, the full election cycles to make this a more durable uh, relationship? Uh, I share um, Fran's concern about the TTC. Um, I, I do still I would still stand by my previous argument on the separate tracks. I think uh, given the um, how tough I've been on the US on this panel, uh, I should actually say that the US has done quite a lot to address European concerns about the IRA. Uh, and that was done through a separate track. So this separate track business seems to work when things are difficult. Uh, and the TTC seems to work on these sort of positive um, uh, conversations. I think, yeah, the achievement around uh, the bureaucratic connections and uh, getting these teams uh, to work together and realize that they have um, similarities and similar goals has been quite good. Uh, what I would like to see, I'm not particularly optimistic about it, but I, I would like to see more of an achievement for uh, the working group on surprise, surprise, uh, sustainable um, uh, sustainability and sustainable industry. Um, so I understand that the focus has been on the GSA and hopefully uh, we will reach some sort of agreement in the next two months, but there's a much broader conversation to be had um, on uh, sustainable building techniques, uh, on um, the whole ESG debate, which um, has sort of, um, the definition is the same, but the US and the EU haven't really worked together on what uh, the framework should be for assessing ESG investments. Why is that not part of the TTC? Uh, it strikes me as something that would be uh, ideal for the TTC. Um, and this is a working group which hasn't gone so well so far, perhaps because uh, the conversation has been dominated by the GSA. So that would be an achievement, but I share the concern over durability of the TTC overall. Well, we're running a run, half run out of time. Thank you so much, Fran, Dan, and Charles for this discussion and debrief on the US-EU summit. Uh, on turning our heads to the future a little bit too and setting out a to-do list and, and how to check off that to-do list between the United States and the European Union here uh, to our audience. Thank you for joining and please do continue to follow the Atlantic Council's work, the Europe Center and the Geoeconomic Center, especially and, and how we follow all of these tracks our great panelists have mentioned. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you soon at the Atlantic Council.